good life is being saved from here. I was looking at it last night and said, I want to see that. Hello, hello, hello. Can you hear me in the back? Can you hear me in the back? Can y'all hear me back there? Not really. Can you turn me up just a tad more? David, we turn me up just just turn turn me up just a tad. Four five four. That way see if they can hear me in the back back there. Hello, 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 hello. Can you hear me in the back? Can you hear me in the back? Can you hear me now? Okay. All right, all right, all right. I hope everybody's doing good. Trying to get your hug in. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I was talking to Dennis. Dennis and Cheryl been here about a year tomorrow. I think he said a year. Y- y'all came in this week. What'd you say? The eleventh. They came in a year. The eleventh. They just been here a year. So that'd be pretty exciting. Les sold his house in Amarillo. He, him, and Don are looking for houses right now. So if anybody knows a house that's okay, there we go. So. The Looking for a house. He's looked at a lot of them already, and um, not really found one around where he wants to be at. And, uh, so, anyways, just be keep him in prayer. His, he and his wife make their transition to come be a part of Calvary Chapel Waco. I'm, I'm honored that, that the Lord would bring you down here. Honestly, all of you. I'm honored that the Lord brought all you to to this church, and um, I am getting better. Hello, hello. I'm going to use her microphone. Anyways, I think we got everything ready for Friday. Um, very excited. I, I chopped all the meat, added all the meat together um, by pound to see if I had enough. And I have 270 pounds cooked brisket. You have to cook almost 500 pounds to get 275 pounds of brisket to get there. But uh, we cooked a lot of briskets, and uh, we chopped it and weighed it. And I'm going to give each girl a third of a pound of meat, which is like a good fist size. So they're going to get plenty. And uh, I have plenty. Oh, I have plenty. And so we're going to take them down there. And um, David's got everything on his side. I have everything on my side. And uh, I know they did the Bible study last night with the girls, but didn't tell them. Apparently, I thought maybe you'd at least tell those girls. But they didn't tell them, so they, they don't even have no idea what's coming their way Friday. And uh, just very excited. You know, I shared quickly of the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. And, you know, the Samaritan woman represents almost all those women in prison. Because they're not, because the Samaritan woman wasn't guiltless. <laughs> she was guilty of being, you know, who she was for the choices she made. But the Lord, you know, had his eyes on her. I mean, zeroed in on her. And uh, that just blows me away to think that that's the God that I'm serving and proclaiming and pointing to. And I'm so blessed to do that because I can, I can sense that kind of love that he has for those outcasts. And he said, when I was in prison, you visited me. And I'm going to step above it, and I'm taking some brisket in that book. <laughs> and you know what? We're taking ice-cold watermelon. We're going to take our baptism in there. We're going to fill it up with ice and put watermelon in there, get it good and cold, and we're going to give those women some good cold watermelon. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Yes, she knows that we're going to preach the gospel. She's good with us preaching the gospel. There are other prisons already reaching out, saying, of course, we could come over there. But uh, anyways, uh, let's just pray through this one and see how this one goes, because it's a lot of work. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for these opportunities that you lay before us, that you inspire us to birth, Lord, that you, you, you put in our hearts to birth it out of us, Lord. And so, Father, we just look forward to tonight's study, what we're going to glean from it, and what we're going to experience on Friday, Lord, and and even tomorrow, Lord, as we set up for that. And we just thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.
Last night we were at the men's Bible study, and we happened to start, we get off the subject often, but <laughs> we were talking about the uh, glorious appearing of Christ, and I'm going to read that. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodly, ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that blessed hope, it's, it's a blessed assurance, because hope <coughs> is like an assurance in, in uh, Bible uh -huh. <laughs> um, so that's <laughs> Titus 2, 11 through uh, 13. So let's sing, uh, we're going to sing Blessed Assurance. I believe I am. Yes, sir. I believe we are. We're going to sing with the chorus. Let's start with the chorus. This is my story. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchased of Born of His Spirit, His blood. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst in my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission. All is at rest. I am my Savior. Am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, the 
lost in his love. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Praising my Savior all the day long. Oh Lord, oh Lord, oh Lord, oh Lord.
Amen, amen. All right, there we go. There we go. Hey, tomorrow the Kim's br- breakfast is not at Kim's. It's at Toasted Oak. Yolk. <laughs> Toasted Yolk tomorrow. They do got pretty good breakfasts over there, <laughs> Toasted Yolk. Anyway, that's a Toasted Yolk. And then, of course, the next couple of days be praying for us as we're getting ready for the prison. I'm thankful for that opportunity again. And uh, thankful that it was financially provided for and then some. And so uh, we were able to do a few extra things because of the blessings. And so that was just it's overwhelming when, when, when God shows up and your vision, you know, with more than you can even imagine. And uh, I walk in that blessing all the time. I, I told my son Jacob, I said, you know, the first, you know, 50 years of my life, I had to work for everything. And uh, the last, you know, few years, God just overwhelmed me with, with, with free stuff. And... Um, and I say free stuff. It's not free, but it's uh, not something I'd go get for myself. And I'm just thankful that that, um, that the Lord honors his word in your life. And so if you walk his word out and you trust him and you walk it out, you'll see for yourself, you know, what comes with that. And, um, you know, I mentioned my brother the, uh, the other day, Sunday, and uh, I was thinking about, you know, our testimony, when you're a criminal and you're, um, you know, and you came out of that lifestyle and you get saved, God forgives you for all that past. Your record, everything that's on paper, you're forgiven. And so when you die and you stand before the Lord, it's gone. But if you walk away from the Lord and you walk a different path, you get in trouble, the worldly court system brings all that back and then holds you accountable for all that and then you're judged for your past even if it was 20 years ago you're judged for your past when it comes to convicting you or not convicting you but for sentencing you right you can you, you can't be convicted on your past stuff but you can be sentenced on your history see that's the thing about the world the world's ready to throw your past at you if you if you walk its path it's going to it's not going to let you forget, and it's going to use it against you. But when you walk with the Lord, your past can't catch up with you. It can in the natural sense, but spiritually it cannot take you out. I've known people that got saved and an old charge came back and they had to go to prison or jail for it, but they wrote it out like a man. They wrote it out with Christianity. My brother Randy Carl is there right now doing just that. He's, he's accepted his responsibility. We've loved him and walked him through his sins and we walked him through his conviction and we walked him through what he had to walk through and uh, we watched him we either believe god can redeem a man or he can't redeem a man we either you know reject certain kinds of men or we accept all men who what is it you know and god doesn't give us that option that's why we go to the prisons and so we can't make any judgment calls to go into prison and so i just want you know i just want us to be aware that the lord you know, absolutely, when we walk with him, he frees us from our past and our past choices, and, and he doesn't hold them against us, but the world absolutely will bring it all back up on you and make you hold you accountable to it. Last week, we were in Je- Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah is telling the people how bad they are. Well, let me mention uh, real quick that Annette's daughter, Meadow, She's had some fainting spells and went to a doctor and, and tried to get some diagnosis of what's going on. They weren't sure what was happening. Put her on some medicine. Well, she had two fainting spells today. And so, as you can imagine, Annette is a concerned mother and worried about her daughter and just asked us to pray for her. Let's go ahead and just, Lord, we just pray for Meadow. We just pray, Lord, that you just, whatever's going on inside of her, that you'll just, you, you'll touch that area, Lord God, and heal her. And we trust you, and I pray for Annette and Tori as you give them peace and to be able to trust you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So in Jeremiah chapter 29, we had just saw Jeremiah come out from, hand, from with all the kings and all the leaders in, of the area talking about rebelling against Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Nebuchadnezzar would be like a foreigner leader, right? Because he's, he's, he's Babylonian. And he's not Jewish. And 
the Jewish people want a Jewish king right now. They want Hezekiah to stay king, or I think he's the king. Uh, they want him to stay the king. The Lord said he's not going to be the king no more. The Lord says you're not going to get the king you want. You're going to get the king I have for you. Now in Israel, they have their own culture. They have their own lifestyle. They have their own religion. And so they have their own rituals. And in and, and the Jewish religion was actually a message. The, 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 the whole ceremonies, all the feasts and all the sacrifices and all the law, all that was supposed to be a story continuously pointing to Jesus, pointing to the Messiah, pointing to the future date of salvation. And so the whole purpose of all that was to prepare hearts and minds for that, for Jesus coming. And... Um, and so without all that, without all the customs, it kinda, you, you kind of take, you, you take Israel's ability to be Jewish, you know? And so you, if you take all their ability to be Jewish, then, they, then, they're, then they're nobody. You, you've taken their culture away from them. And that's what God is doing. God is taking everything away from them. He's sending them to Babylon as ca- uh, to be captives. And none of them believe that God is in that. I know that in our day and age, we have presidents that we vote for. And there's always debates within the Christian church on which one do we vote, do we vote for? Which one should a Christian vote for? And um, I will tell you this, that, that the way things are going, the way we've seen the last, you know, eight years, actually 20 years for some of us, uh, we realize that there's really not a hope that man should ever put into another man to get us through it. Whatever it is, right? <laughs> Whatever, wherever they're trying to get through, we keep going to a man. And then what the world does is the world pits us against each other by making you choose the left or right side. God always puts who he wants to put in there, by the way. Always has. And always will. When he says he's putting Nebuchadnezzar as leader over the Jewish people, they absolutely said, no way, Jose. Um. I think that we, we need to be ready to have leaders that we don't follow. I think we have to be ready to be underneath leaders that God put over us as part of our punishment. And, and when I say punishment, it's part of what we've sown. We're, we're just reaping what we've sown. We took prayer out of school. We allowed that to happen. We took Bible out of school. We let that happen. We we, we started allowing Christianity to be kind of pulled back from things in the world to kind of move its way. And, and so the world has gotten louder and stronger and, and a bigger voice. And the church, is, is, the voice is blurred. It's muffled. It's not clear. It's not distinct. There's not, there's not very many people in the world that respect the church today. There's not very many people that respect Christians today. That wasn't the case 50 years ago. That wasn't the case years ago as Christians were always, unless there was a new community of believers, you know, like a Jehovah's Witness community changing, then it caused a disruption. But if they were just, matter of fact, in the early history of America, you could always tell when a revival happened because the bars got slow. The alcohol sales went down. We're not seeing any of that. We don't see anything changing. In our day and age. That's because Christians are doing as much buying of that stuff as anybody else is. And that's a shame. That we're not separate from the world. That we're still like the world. And and we want to boogie, boogie, boogie. And then we want to praise, praise, praise. And I get it. We live in a great country where there's there's all that going on. And and, and, and who don't like a good boogie? (laughs) Let me just tell you. In this life, the cross says sacrifice. When you get married, it's a sacrifice. Take all other men and women off the table. That's a sacrifice. No more looking good. And then you start making sacrifices for your family down the road. You start making sacrifices today to take care of them down the road. And so the cross of Jesus Christ is really a message of how life's supposed to be because life is about 
a sacrifice and God doing, setting the bar for what a sacrifice truly is because he's God and he made the sacrifice for a godless people. When, when, when we weren't looking for God, he was looking for us. We, when we were found by God, we weren't necessarily looking for him when we were found by him. It says, in, you know, I read all the time that it says that we grope for him, although he's not very far from any one of us. And so for years, you know, we grope through life and we just try to figure out what the meaning of life is and what the purpose of life, life is. And then what happens is you get a taste of big red. And you can't get enough to taste the big red. Let me tell you, once I tasted big red, I never went back to anything. I drink a Dr. Pepper, but big red, it's, it's, there's something to, that's addictive to that stuff, <laughs> is what I'm trying to say. And things in this life, it's not good for me, but things in this life are like that. And spiritually, we have to be careful because the children of Israel lost their whole religion. So what God is doing is now that they're in, in Babylon, he's writing them a letter. We started last week in that letter. He wrote this letter Jeremiah did, the Lord told Jeremiah to write a letter from the Lord to the captives, instructing them on how to be good citizens of a foreign country under a foreign king. And we're going to pick up in, um, I'm going to reread the letter, but we're going to pick up in in, uh, chapter 29, verse 4. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused. Listen, to it's the Lord who have caused it. To who I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Now remember, this is a godless society where anything goes. And God is saying, settle in. And get comfortable in your own house and just live there for a while. You're going to be there 70 years. So I I think about us going into new territory with new leaders and new regimes and new whatever. Whoever whoever it is, it it goes forward. No matter who's over us, we are called to be a certain kind of citizen in that country. Paul said when Nero was the Pharaoh, when Nero was the Caesar, Paul said, pray and obey your leaders get up he said pray and respect your leaders and Nero was the one killing Christians and leading the people so what is Paul telling us you know uh, and as I and, and as I told you I remember way back in 2010 or whenever Obama was elected you know we knew he was very leaning left and we knew that that that, that he was pro-homosexual and pro-gay but when he lit up the White House in rainbow colors it, it sent a message to the whole world Christianity is no longer a theme of of the country. Christianity no longer holds the value that it's always held before. I get it. Because listen, God never told us, God never told us to have heaven on earth. God never told us that we were going to have our own country, a a God-fearing country. He said, blessed is the country whose king fears the Lord. But he never promised Christians a Christian country. Now, Christians can do the, what they can to start a Christian country, but unless the Lord's in it, it's not going to happen. There's never been a Christian country. There's been countries that proclaim Christianity, but there's never been a Christian country other than the United States. And even then, I don't know how good some of the founding fathers were truly were morally speaking anyway. But that's not on me, but I know there were some good ones. I know there were some good testimonies out there for some good founding fathers. But I know that not all of them were good morally. And so what I'm saying is we shouldn't be of the type that are affected by who's president. Because who's president does not change who God is. Whose president does not change what Jesus Christ did for us? Who is our president and what policies they put in place may affect us, our day-to-day life, our circumstances, but it should not affect our spirit and our faith and trust in God. Right? I mean, 
it, 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 it looks like and it feels like with because if you're only if if you stand on the side where all the world is yelling and and you're yelling the same thing the world's yelling and you're saying the same thing the world's saying and when I say the world I mean celebrities media the world politicians all the world uh, I think you need to look at who who you're hanging out with and and then look on the opposing side and and you'll see people like us standing there quiet not holding signs not flipping people off, not freaking out, not burning nothing down, not trashing nothing, just, just wanting to live a life and be a light to other people so that people will want what we have. We do not want to turn people off to Christ because we're ugly. We want to turn people on to Christ because we love like Christ. He says, Verse 5, build houses and dwell in them, plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and beget sons and daughters and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands so that they may bear sons and daughters that you may be increased there and not diminished. You're not supposed to lose down there. You're supposed to keep winning down there because here's what the Lord is saying. I'm with you. He's telling him I'm with him and seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive and pray to the Lord for it, for in its peace you will have peace. Pray for our city, pray for our government, pray for our president, pray for those in power, pray for our leaders, pray for those that have power over us. You pray for the peace of your neighborhood, you pray for your peace of your house, you pray for these things. God says to do it. And if he says to do it, there's going to be a result. You may not understand it. You may not even recognize it when it's happening. But later on, you will look back and you will see how God had given you peace, especially when you're actively pursuing it. We pray, Lord, expose the works of darkness. So we always pray, expose the works of darkness. Uh save people, bring people to the light, bring people into the kingdom. That's our prayer. But nowhere does he say, try to change the culture. Nowhere does he say, try to change the people of that city. What he, what, because here's the deal. His whole relationship with them was, was in their worship, in how they worshiped, and how they obeyed the law. Well, now all the temple is raided. All the vessels that are used to worship God are in Babylon. Most of them are. The rest of them are about to get taken, but they're all going to be there. Because later on, we're going to see Belshazzar bring out the goat, the chalice, and he's going to drink from it, and then all of a sudden a hand, a finger is going to write on the wall. It says, you have take a take a something, take a take a something. But it says, you have been weighed and found wanting. I mean, you're about to get judged. And it says he messed his pants, basically. His bowels just unloosened when he saw that. And he died. He, didn't, he did not know that that night he was praying. He was believing that he was the most powerful man. And that night the, uh, the Persians were already breaking into the city and coming through the gutters and breaking through holes in the city already on their way because they didn't have cell phones and TikTok. They couldn't tell him. So while they were in there partying, and he was getting all cocky, pulling out the Lord's vessels, the Lord already sent an army on him. But here's, here's what I think is unique. The Lord is not telling them that I'm going to go on a hiatus for 70 years while you're in captivity since you cannot go to the temple and you cannot perform these religious duties. I can no longer be in relationship with you. I'll be back in 70 years. He didn't do that. He didn't let the rituals keep him from having a relationship with the people that he loved. What he was looking at right now is an opportunity for them to just have a relationship with him like us. With no, with no religious symbolisms, no religious activities involved except prayer. The only thing they had to do and, and, and that Daniel did and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we know they did, pray three times a day. That was the only religious thing that they had was the times that they prayed to the Lord as part of their custom, but all other customs 
or out the window because they're in a foreign city, they're in a foreign land, they're, they're cap- they're, they're, they have to fall under the culture that they're under, just like you and I have to live under the culture that we're under. And so we have to figure out how to maneuver through the culture that we're around. I shared with the men Tuesday morning, my sister teaches at Conley, and there is now a transvestite teacher who is starting a club for, you know, anybody that's in that spectrum, and it's, called, it's a safe place, which I, I get that's coming, and they want to do it, that's fine, because this is their world. But here's where, here's where you can tell the devil is very, very good at it because the lady that's sponsoring this class now comes on, sends an email to all the teachers and says, now imagine you're a teacher and you get this email and it says, hey, I'm the new agent or advocate for blah, 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 however she described herself. I have these stickers and pins for any teacher who wants to make their classroom a safe space. So if your morals and your morality says, you know, I can't really affirm that. I can't really say it's okay. So I'm not going to take a sticker. I'm not going to take a, a pen. So automatically, that one likes us. That one hates us. And all of a sudden, you, you haven't done anything but reject the button. And you've now become the enemy because you won't take. I watched an episode of Seinfeld years ago, and a guy goes to an AIDS walk, and they say, here's a button. He goes, I don't need to wear that. I'm walking the AIDS walk. Well, you got to wear the button. He goes, no, I'm not wearing the button. you got to wear the button. If you're going to be that, you got he said, that's why I'm not wearing AIDS, the button, because you're telling me i got to wear it. And they beat him up because he wouldn't wear that button. And it's funny that just even though all those years ago that this scenario is being played out, crosses because here we are today and and i told my sister i said listen sister what are you going to say what are you going to do about that can you do anything can you at least voice something can you at least get in there and, and she said i did go to my principal and had a conversation about all the other issues we had going on how important they were and we're going to throw this one in there on top of all these bullying cussing out teachers p- teachers getting beat up fights all this stuff that we're dealing with over here and you just want to throw something else in the mix. She said, we had a transgender student and nobody messed with them. And we treated them with respect. We, 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 did, we, we handled them correctly. But now you want to just change the game. And you want to force this on us now. And so that's, that's what we have to learn to live with. So what do you do in situations like that? You do what some people do and you homeschool. You go, you know what? I'm just going to homeschool. I'm just going to figure this out, or I'm going to try to find a way to get my kids to another school, or I'm going to be a good parent. I'm going to stay on top of my kids. I'm going to maneuver my kids through whatever the teachers tell them. I want to be able to listen to it and counter it if I need to counter it or encourage it if I need to encourage it. As long as parents are involved with their kids and have some understanding, we can guide them through it. I remember my my son and my daughter, when they were younger, they, they didn't always agree with me. They didn't always believe with me, but now they're adults paying taxes. They listen to me now, and they trust me, and they go, you know what, Dad, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. And so I'm not right because I want to be right. I'm right because I follow something that's right, you know, and so it keeps me going. And it says, and then he goes on to say this, for thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are in your midst deceive you nor listen to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. Um, For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you a future and a hope, then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me 
when you search for me with your whole heart. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. So Daniel is in Babylon. He's in captivity. It says, in the first year, chapter, chapter 9, verse 1, in the first year of Darius, the son of Asherus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, Babylonians, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books or the letter or the scroll that Jeremiah wrote, he says, understood by the letter that Jeremiah wrote, the number of years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, and that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Israel. Desolation of Jerusalem. Then I set my face, listen to this, then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments, we have sinned and committed iniquity and have done wickedly and rebelled, even departing from your precepts in your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us shame of face. Uh, as it is this day to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, those near and those far off in all the countries which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. Notice it's the unfaithfulness that causes them to reap what they've sown. Um, it also says, uh, our, o Lord, to us belongs shame of face, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers. To the Lord our God belongs mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse of the, and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, hath been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his words, which he has spoken against us and against our judges who judged us by bringing upon us great disaster. Notice the leaders brought the disaster upon the people. Things are going to happen to us because of what some leaders do. But we as Christians, God will plant us in a good way underneath the whatever they're bringing on us, whatever they put on us. We have the ability through the Lord to get through it. They can't take our faith away. They can't take our hope away. They might take your rights away. They might take your good lifestyle away. But they can't take your ticket to heaven, your salvation. They cannot take your joy, your hope. They can't take those things. You have to understand that you might have to lose those things going forward because of the land that we live in. They are not, they are not sympathetic to the church any longer. There is no fear of God in their eyes or in their heart. It's obvious of what they're doing, what they're allowing. It's obvious that we live in a different world, that we live in a different time, and we need to wake up and make sure that we are on guard. I'm not trying to sound the alarm, but I'm trying to sound the alarm. I'm not trying to put panic in your heart. I'm trying to put lead in your feet so that you can stand on the rock and you're stabilized and you're not moving around by the fear of what you hear on TV. World War III is about to take place. That's not slowing down anytime soon up there in the Middle East. That's going to get worse. Things are going to come crashing down. Our economy is going to be affected. Our money is going to be affected. We're going to be affected. And it's going to hit us like that. Right now, we're seeing the process. That, everything that took place in the last couple of days with the stock market, the bombs, 
all these things. There's so many things going on. There's military moving in the Mediterranean. They're going that way. They're headed in that direction. This is no joke. The Lord is working in this world. But here's the thing. The Lord is also into the one person, the individual. He's, he's with you as much as he is with the world. He, is a, he, 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 knows his, he knows everything about you, brother, just like he knows everything about creation. And he is just as focused on you as he is on me, anybody else that claims to be religious. There is not one religious person that God is more focused on than another person. We're all precious in his sight. He died for every single one of us. He saw every single one of us when he died. He was there when every one of us was born. He was there when those died. He is there through the whole process. We are onto something good in the midst of chaos. We are onto something wonderful in the midst of darkness. We walk in the light, and the light is with us. We have nothing to fear but doubt. Doubt is your only fear. It says, if, 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 the, reason I, the reason I'm saying this is because Jeremiah 29, what we just read, the, the, the Jeremiah 29, 11, it says you will seek me on that day. The context of it is what Daniel's doing. The true context of the scripture that Jeremiah 29, 11 is written is written at, for the moment that we see Daniel doing the exact thing that the Lord says on that day, on the day of your deliverance, on that day you will seek my face for the future, for the hope, what's next. And God will begin to show you because it says, it says, um, uh, verse, look at verse 20. Jump to verse 20. Yeah, Daniel chapter 9. Verse 20. Now, while I was still, while I was speaking, praying, and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yet while I was still speaking in my prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly. I looked that up, and that means to be tired or wore out. That he, was, he came in like he was in a battle, and it tells us that later on he was battling with Michael, I mean with the demons, and Michael came and delivered him, remember? He says, yet while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached out, reached me about the time of the evening offering, and he informed me, and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, oh, I'd love to hear that in my name. Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. Listen to that, skill to understand. That's what every single one of us needs to pray, is to have the ability, to have the skill to understand what God's Word is saying to us, not just a cliche. Most people use God's Word as a cliche without really understanding the depth of what's really hidden in the meaning of that. But uh, he, 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 this is skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplication, the command, notice the Lord sent a command, went out, that I have come to tell you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. I'm not going to read the vision, but I just wanted you to see that when Daniel, when, when Daniel did exactly what Jeremiah said in his letter for them to do, Daniel did it, and Daniel, as soon as he realized, he said he understood. Now, here's the deal. We can understood, understand the times that we live in. We can understand how many of you feel like we're in the last days? You see almost all the hands go up. Of course we feel the last days. We recognize it. We can. And even if Daniel says when man is going to and fro in the earth, and there ain't been a time in the world that you can go to and fro like you can go to and fro now. And... Um, Knowledge is increased, which would say it also would happen in the last days. The ability to attain knowledge is increased. We know more now than, you know, 100 years ago, people didn't know what we can know now, what a 10-year-old knows, you know. 
And so that's not necessarily a good thing to know too much, just so you know. <laughs> just so you know something else. You can know too much. Um, I, I want to say this before we close. I, I think that during these days that we live in, I think the anticipation of November coming is going to keep many people on edge in the world because people in, in the world are, more, are, are just as concerned about our elections as Americans are. But I think that um, going forward, at least it can start with us, that we just have the right attitude going forward. Nothing wrong with pointing out inconsistencies. There's nothing wrong with pointing, because it says expose the works of darkness. We just aren't called to be ugly with it. We just don't do it in an ugly way. You know, we, we have to be careful, because I don't, I don't think you should be mocking the president. Um, I, think, I think we need to show respect to the position and to the office as the Lord has told us to. I think that works to our benefit spiritually if we honor the president. I honored Barack Obama. I never said ugly things about him. I just said I don't like his policies. I think he's bringing in demonic policies, but I, su I support him. I prayed for him. prayed for Bill Clinton. I prayed for all of them because that's what we're called to do. Right? That's what we're called to do, and we need to understand that that's our position as Christians. Is to pray for our leaders and to accept the results and to accept what God has put in, in place because God ultimately, even if somebody was cheated, even if they ended up in there, that's still God. That's still the Lord. And if it's the Lord, then we have to submit to that and we have to surrender to that. It doesn't mean that the Lord is doing it for a good reason. It doesn't mean he's doing it because he loves us. He's doing it because he has a purpose and we just have to trust him with that. Right? And, I see, and, and so I'm telling us, I'm, I'm saying to us that I pray that you find your peace and hope in the scriptures, in Jesus Christ and who he is as the son of God and the savior of the world, king of kings and lord of lords. And that you look for any opportunities to bring peace to your environment, to bring peace to your life, to bring peace to others, to do what you can to be a peaceful person. To be a peacemaker. Because, I, because God told us that, that, that blessed are us, the peacemakers. And, and, and listen, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You can be the wisest, smartest, most knowledgeable, speaking tongues and speaking angels and all these. But if you don't have love, you're nothing. Love is the key of everything. But love does not mean tolerance and affirmation. Let's don't get that confused either, okay? All right. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you, Lord, that you love us. And Lord, I pray that you, um, that you touch those that are sick and that are hurting, especially Meadow, Lord. We just pray again for her. Pray for my dad, Lord. Pray for those. Pray for Lynn is dealing with their issues, Lord. My dad dealing with his diagnosis. Father, we just pray for direction on the right procedure. We pray for those that might have been diagnosed already, Lord, that aren't sure what's going on with them, Lord. We just pray that you um, speak to their hearts and let them know that their spirits and souls can definitely be 100% good with you. It's these bodies, Lord, that are breaking down. These bodies we will leave behind. The outward man is perishing, but, Lord, we need the inward man to continue to, to thrive. And so I pray, Lord God, for those that are sick, that you would touch their bodies, heal them, even my knee, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Yeah.